noticed that when you did the transition metal class paper questions, there were one or two things that hadn't been picked up on as you went through the slides. So I thought, I'm going to do this and see if it gives us a bit of a hand. Okay. So first bit, we're looking at what the true definition of a transition metal is. It's not just that it's found between group two and group three of the periodic table. And we're going to be looking at oxidation states. Okay. We will also touch on oxidation and reduction. So our transition metals, in reality, as I said, they're not just every element between group two and group three. The true definition states that transition metal is a metal with an incomplete D subshell and at least one of their ions. Okay, there are transition metals that we would think of as transition metals that do not form an ion with an incomplete D subshell. That's why that's important. All right, the next bit is looking at how we fill the orbitals. So in general, the transition metals will follow the outbound principle. So what we would do is fill our electrons singularly per shell. So 4s filled first. Then once we get to the end, so we'd have 4s2, then 3d1, 3d2, 3d3, 4, and 3d5. Remember for our d, or d electrons, they all have to be spinning in the same direction. So your arrows would be pointing the same way. Once we get to 3d5, we then go back and double up in 3d1. So we'd have two electrons there. So it'd be 3d2, then 3d, sorry, 3d, whichever x, y we're doing, would be two. Then one, 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 seven, you'd put two into the second one as well, and so on. The second one going in, they will all spin in the opposite direction to the first one, but all the second ones will spin in the same direction. Does that make sense? So initially, I've had all my arrows pointing up the way, and it filled the first time. The second time, my arrows would be pointing down the way. Okay. Now, point at the bottom, it says when a transition metal loses an electron to form an, atom, an ion, the s orbitals are lost before the d orbitals. Our four s orbitals are full before 3d because the energy you need to put them in is very, very close. Okay. 4s, we've only got to put two electrons in. Whereas 3D, we want to go up to 10 in. Okay, so in terms of energy, it's easier to put it into 4S. In terms of losing them, we need to look at the structure of our atom. If we and we need to look at all the rings. Okay. If we think back to what we said in atomic the no, sorry, in electromagnetic spectrum, about the fact that we had seven shells going all the way or seven areas seven n numbers going all the way around each atom we would have n1 in the center then n2 further out three four five six seven okay now although our three our 4s and our 3d orbitals are very very close there are differences in that our 4s orbitals are going to be further away from the nucleus than the 3d orbitals okay so if you were to draw your shells, and yes, please include 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 3d, 4s if you want. But what we would find is that everything that had a 1 would be within 2. Everything that was number 2 would be within 3. And everything, including 3d, is therefore within 4. So you'd have 3d, and then slightly further out, you would have, to have your spherical. 4s shell okay now if we think back to higher and we were talking about screening and shielding and the fact that our inner electrons shielded the outermost electrons from the attraction to the nuclei okay if we then look at where our 4s is in comparison to 3d we can see it's further out so for that reason you would need to lose the 4s before the 3d. So there's more shielding and screening between the nucleus and the 4s electrons than there is with the 3d. Happy with that? Another way of looking at it is there's only actually two electrons there. So to get rid of that whole shell, we'd only have to take two away. Yes, there's shielding and screening, very important, but our 3d, we could have up to 10 electrons to get rid of. Okay, but there's also less screening and shielding. Happy with that? Right, we're just going to whiz through the next couple of sheets because they give you the questions and the answers. And then we're going on to oxidation states. 
Okay. Now, the term oxidation state, it is interchangeable with the term oxidation number. So don't worry which one you see, it means the same thing. Usually it's oxidation state, but we need to be aware that oxidation number is the same thing. And it's probably easier to think about it in terms of a number when you're actually calculating the oxidation state yourself. Right, our oxidation number is basically the charge on the ion. Sorry, is the oxidation number of the transition metal is basically the charge that's on that transition metal when it's in the compound. Okay, and we need to know that an element is said to be in a particular oxidation state when it has a specific oxidation number. Okay, so if it's two plus, its oxidation number is the oxidation state it would be in is two positive. When we're going to calculate the oxidation number of our transition metals, there are six rules that we need to consider. Just bring up the first three, and it's easier for us to see what we're dealing with. Right, if the transition metal is on its own and it's not combined with any other element, the oxidation number of that substance will be zero. Okay, so if I've just got like copper metal, there's nothing else attached to it, it's oxidation number zero. Now, if I have a single atom to it, so if I stick with my copper, if I've got copper chloride, I usually have CuCl2. So to find out my oxidation number of copper in that occasion, I need to look at what's attached to it. So I've already, already said CuCl2, so there's two chloride ions attached to it. Each of those chloride ions has a charge of minus one. Okay? Because each of those two ions has a charge of minus one, the copper would therefore have a two positive charge. Yes, it's as straightforward as that. Now, we've got to watch for hydrogen and oxygen. Okay? As we've always dealt with in past, we've said that hydrogen's in group one and forms a one positive charge. Okay? Our oxygen we say it's in group six, so it's too negative. We do have an exception to both of those rules. For hydrogen, it can combine with a metal. So we could have sodium hydride. Now our metal is going to form a positive ion. Okay, so in that occasion, the hydrogen is going to be negative. It would have a charge of negative one. I know sodium's not a transition metal, but I just felt that one was a good one to use as sodium hydride. Sounds like a common substance. It is a common substance. Our oxygen. I've heard of hydrogen peroxide. Again, it's not a transition metal, but something that we've heard of. So when we've got our peroxides, our oxygens don't have a charge of minus two. Their charge is minus one. Okay? So we need to remember that. The next set of rules. What we've got is, it basically backs up what we said in number two. If we've got fluorine, fluorine is in group seven, it's going to have an oxidation number of minus one. It's the same for all the group seven elements. Okay, They will have their oxidation number of minus one. Now, we need to know that the sum of all the oxidation numbers in our substance for a neutral ion add up to zero. Okay, so we've not quite got to write in them yet, but if I've got, well, I'm going back to copper chloride, when I've got my copper chloride, that overall is a neutral, a neutral substance. Okay, so it's going to be zero. So I've got my two positive, as I said, for my copper, and my two, one negative for chlorine, they add together to give me zero. Now, polyatomic ions, it says in the next section, they are ions that have got a lot of different elements in them, or atoms in them, as they said. They do not have different elements, though. It's something like sulfate. You've known about sulfate for years, SO4. Sulfite, SO3, carbonate, phosphate, those are polyatomic ions. They were the ones in National 5, they were on page 8 of the data book. Offhand, I'm sorry, I can't remember what page they are in your data book. OK, now we need to know that the oxidation numbers, all of them added together. So that would be of our sulfate or our phosphate plus the transition metal that they're attached to is going to be the same as the charge on the overall ion. 
To help with this, I'm going to do one of the questions on page 34 of your booklet. I'm going to choose one of the ones that's got more substances. No, I'm not, because there's only got three in them. Sorry, there's no polyatomic lang there. So if I go for E, OK, we've got manganese oxide. And we need to get the charge on manganese, MnO2. So we know that our manganese plus our two oxygen atoms, the overall charge of that is zero. OK. What I need to do to get my manganese is, say manganese, I don't know what it is, so leave it as Mn, plus oxygen is two times minus two. Remember, oxygen is minus two, it's in group six. One hint for that. And what we then think about is, if I do that multiplication, and start moving things about from side to side, so as I get only the letters on my left-hand side, what am I going to get? So at the moment, I've got Mn plus two times minus two equals zero. OK, so Mn plus minus four will give me zero. Mn on its own, therefore, is two positive. Happy with that one? I'm going to go for one that's got a charge on it. OK, so at this time, if we go for I, it's copper chloride, it's CuCl4, and it tells me it's got a two negative charge. Now, this means that my copper chloride, it overall is going to equal two minus. So then I need to look and see what I've got. So if I was writing it out, I'd have Cu because I'd plus four times Cl. Now I'm trying to work out what copper is, so I'm going to leave that as Cu. And then I'm going to have four times minus one, because each chloride is minus one, and that'll leave me with two minus. Okay? So sort it out. I take my minus four over to the other side where it becomes plus four. But because the overall charge is two minus, that means copper is two positive. You should have done those questions by now. So have a look. You might want to rewind a bit. Have a look as I talk through it and see if that makes sense to you. If we just quickly go look or browse over the answers. There's just a quick summary here about oxidation number. So you've probably noticed from the questions that you've just done that the metals, the transition metals, are in different states or they have different oxidation numbers for different compounds. For example, if we look at manganese, MnO2, so manganese oxide, our manganese has got a four positive char uh, charge. But if we look at G, manganese peroxide, we've got six positive. Okay, so MnO4, two minus, the manganese has got six positive. But H, the manganese in that one, where it was just MnO4 minus, is seven positive. Okay, so different, oh, sorry, different compounds containing the same transition metal can mean the transition metal has different states. Okay. Overall, the most common oxidation number we come to is two positive. Why do you think that? Whoops, I think I hit pause in the middle of my why do you think that would be? So most common, copper two positive. Um, that's probably, that's not the best example. Um, iron two positive. Okay, why? We need to think about what's lost first. First of all, we lose those two 4S electrons. Okay, so it's easy. You wouldn't want to just lose one really because that's putting an instability in the 4S subshell. OK, so it loses them first. Therefore, the most common oxidation number is two positive. We already know that the 3D subshells have got an energy level very, very close to that for the 4S. That's why the 4S fill before the 3D. But we also have to remember 4S are further out. Therefore, they're lost first because there's more shielding. Sorry, yeah, there's more shielding, which makes it more difficult for the nucleus to attract these outermost 4S electrons. OK, but because 3D is relatively close to 4D, uh, sorry, because 3D is relatively close to 4S, it's also possible for 3D electrons to be lost. And this is why we get other oxidation states. OK, now another interesting thing about transition metals is the different oxidation states lead to different colours in the transition metals. Right, since National 5, we've been looking at oxidation and reduction and saying that oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain of electrons. 
Now we can take this further. I know we took it further and higher and we brought in hydrogen and oxygen. But this time, what we're going to do is look at the oxidation number and use that to determine if the reaction is an oxidation or a reduction reaction. For example, we've got here, and it's the same ion electron equation that you've seen from National 5. We've got iron 2 positive changing into iron 3 positive. You should be able to tell me now why 3 positive is more stable than 2 positive. Have a look at the electrons. If I was to give you the full ion electron arrangement, sorry, not ion electron arrangement, the full electron arrangement of iron, I should have said it that way around, what I would tell you is it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d6, 4s2. Okay? Now it's going to lose the two 4s orbit, um, electrons to form Fe2 positive, and that would leave 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d6. So I have four unpaired electrons and one pair of electrons there. Okay, what does it favour? What were we told about special stability? Yeah, we were told if it was half filled or fully filled, the d orbital, that had a special stability. So Fe2 positive is leaving the ion in a very unstable state. So it's going to easily lose that electron to form Fe3 positive. That's part of the reason why when something rusts, initially it'll go a blacky colour. That's Fe2 positive forming, but it's not a stable ion. It'll very quickly keep going and we'll get that red iron oxide and it's iron 3 oxide that forms. Okay, and it's 3 positive. Right, and it's oxidation because there we have got an increase in the oxidation number. The oxidation number has increased from 2 positive to 3 positive. In this one, in a reduction, we've got permanganate changing into manganese. Similar ion electron equation, but it's more like you saw in higher, where you're using water to balance off oxygen and then hydrogen and electrons to balance off the hydrogen atoms that are in the water. Okay, now this time we started with MnO4 minus, but that isn't the oxidation number on manganese. We need to work it out. So we need to take into account that we've got manganese plus four times minus two equals one negative. So if we do that, we've got manganese plus eight negative equals one negative. So our manganese is seven positive. OK, now what's happening as that reaction happens is the manganese in permanganate is changing into manganese ions. Now manganese ions have got two positive charge. This means our oxidation number has changed from seven positive to two positive and it's a reduction reaction. Okay. Yes, we can see that the electrons are on the left hand side, which also indicates reduction, but most important to us at the moment is the change in the oxidation number. Right, in higher, we use the page from the electrochemical series to decide if something was a good oxidation, oxidase, oxidizing or reducing agent. Okay, now on this one, we're looking at the fact that if we've got a metal that's in a high oxidation state, it is going to be a good oxidizing agent. Okay, whereas if the metal's in a low oxidation state, it's going to be a reducing agent. So we need to remember the bit from higher, that if we've got a reducing agent, it itself is oxidised, and if we've got an oxidising agent, it itself is reduced. Okay, we are using it to, so the reducing agent means something else will be reduced, so it itself has to be oxidised. Happy with that? The next couple of sheets are just looking at the questions, but one question I do want to mention was a question on page 36. OK, it goes back to the very first screen. So we'll just flick back quickly for a reason. 
Now, on the very first screen, it said that transition metals are metals with an incomplete D, D subshell in at least one of their ions. Now, the question on page 36 was asking about scandium and zinc and why they're not true transition metals. Now, scandium is number 21. Its electron arrangement is 289, okay? And zinc is 2882. Might be easier for you to see with zinc and that if it forms an ion, it's going to be too positive. It's going to leave you with a full D subshell, okay? Scandium, probably actually scandium, when I look back at it, is just as easy. The two refers to our 4S, and the 9 is coming from 3S2, 3P6, 3D1. Okay, that was 3D1. For it to be an ion, okay, it has to lose the 4S first, but it's also going to lose that 1D electron as well. Okay. So because of that, you will not have a partially filled D subshell. Your SC will have no electrons. As it says there, ZN is going to be full. I hope this has helped.